The presenting sponsor of today's episode is By Night Studios. Prowl New Orleans' French Quarter as a vampire during Saturnalia, an immersive experience produced by By Night Studios in partnership with our dear friends, Reverie Studios. They're turning the entire French Quarter into your event space with multiple venues and even an in-character second line. Plus, I was on the writing team for it, so go to VampireLarp.com and get 10% off using code PORTSAGA10 and treat yourself to the quintessential vampire experience. The following episode contains adult content, violence, and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Can I help you, officer? License and registration. Here's my license. Registration is in the glove compartment. You mind if I... Slowly, no. Yeah. Suter? Ted Suter. That's that's right, that's me. (laughs) Can I ask what I've done, officer? We've had a couple animal attacks in this area. We're making sure people don't sit on the shoulder too long. Not after the sun goes down. A dark highway like this, we wouldn't want to see someone get hurt. I had no idea. I appreciate the warning. Yeah. News like that tends to draw a certain type of person. You wouldn't be a certain type of person, would you? Uh, no, no, officer. Uh, the truck is just having engine trouble. Waiting for my girlfriend to get me. Uh, here's the registration. Mm-hmm. Your truck has seen better days, Yeah. Yeah. And appears to have an expired registration. Really? Uh, that's probably the wrong one. Hang on. You want to tell me what's under this tarp in the back, Mr. Suter? Uh, tools. Just a toolbox and some other odds and ends. Uh Uh-huh. How about you step out of the truck, please? If you could just give me a minute, I'll get you the correct registration. I said step out of the truck. Listen, if you would just relax a second. Get out of the truck. Or you're getting a flare to the face. Hey, 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 hey. Easy now. Easy. I'm coming out. Hands up. See? See? Just put the flare gun down, all right? No one needs to get hurt. No one needs to get hurt? Tell that to Sam and Rosita. What you things did to them? I'm sure it's just a misunderstanding. Don't you take one more step. Not one more step. My entire squad is on the way. Try any of that supernatural shit on me and I'll set you on fire and piss all over your ashes. Friend, that plastic badge and sad Kevlar vest aren't fooling anyone. You out here all by your lonesome? What's under the tarp? You thought it was a good idea to go out after dark, alone, to hunt vampires? Not a step. Okay, okay. They were good people, had families... We don't want to hurt anyone. But we don't want every vigilante with a gun thinking they're Van Helsing either. If you all would put your stakes away, maybe we could come to an agreement. I made a promise. One I don't intend to break. What's under the tarp? Get that flare gun out of my face and I'll show you. No way, man. We can part ways. No harm, no foul. Show me what's under it. This is not the move you want to make. Quit stalling. I'm telling you, friend, walk away. You do not want to know what's under there. Show me. Don't say I didn't warn you. Surprise. Vampire the Masquerade, Port Saga. An original World of Darkness drama created and produced by Rachel J. Wilkinson. Episode 11, Under the Hunter's Moon. Ted Suter? It's an anagram of Titus Reed. Clever. I'm willing to play bait next time. It's okay. It's fun. 
these hunter assignments. You know he's doing it to wear you down, right? I'm all right. I promise. I'm just tired. They say after you've been a vampire for a while, time loses any meaning. When you're mortal, you're acutely aware of how much time you do or do not have. It's this fleeting resource you have to manage, like money and sleep. You make time, save time, uh, buy time, do time, lose time, waste time, kill time. Success is measured by how quickly you achieve some grand feat. The younger, the more wondrous the accomplishment. Some people say that's because we're obsessed with youth. I say it's because we're obsessed with time. Top two reasons people become vampires. One, so they will never die. Two, so they have eternity to finish whatever they start. And when you look at it that way, it's no wonder kindred society is made up of the fearful and meandering. It's been a month since Usher killed Aaron and Lawrence. A month since we freed the Thin Bloods Dante Mendoza held captive. A month since Alexander Quill seized the city. And through it all, the Second Inquisition has been out in force. Thirty nights of blood with casualties on all sides, and my penance far from paid. I guess I haven't been a vampire for long enough yet because I am keenly aware of time. Rebel, would you call us puppets or cannon fodder? Well, puppets at least have the illusion of acting independently. No, we're cannon fodder. That's what I thought. Okay, so don't get weird about this. But there's no one I'd rather be cannon fodder with. Because I'm the one keeping you alive. What was with that don't look under the tarp thing? I just... I don't know. He just lost his friends and was clearly an amateur. He, he was this knot of anger and grief and... I don't like it any more than you do. But right now, it's cannon fodder against cannon fodder. And if it's a question of them or us, it's gonna it's be them. It's gonna be them, yeah. I know. According to Port Saga Police, <laughs> there have already been over 300 homicides this year. That's over 300 people murdered. And they wonder why families are moving out of the city at a record pace. And the city's solution, the Port Commission is negotiating with Troy Industries, yeah, for a deal worth upwards of $200 million to revitalize the harbor. They want to use your tax dollars not to put more cops on the streets, but to build a parking lot for rich people's boats. You can't make this stuff up. It is literally unbelievable. You cool with going in, or you need a minute? I'm good. Titus, look at me. Do not let Marlo get under your skin. Only if you don't let Usher get under yours. Mm, deal. Let's go. From the outside, Marlo's photography studio looks like any other storefront gallery with oversized windows, bright, airy spaces, and a faded brick facade. It's so expected it's unremarkable. Which you'd think would be an embarrassment among sophisticates and connoisseurs. But from a vampire's perspective, it's pitch perfect down to the inoffensive photographs hanging in the windows, a collection of city architecture captured from mildly intriguing angles, artwork bound for the rooms of some top-tier chain hotel in a second-rate Midwestern city. It's by design, of course, to remain inconspicuous while we use her basement as a command and control center in our fight against the Second Inquisition. Downstairs, a map of Port Saga hangs dotted by tiny red and black pins. Red for where hunters attack, and black for where we hit back. There used to be a lot more red up there. And as much as I hate to admit it, Prince Alexander Quill has a lot to do with our progress. On the far end of the room, Usher stands in front of a bulletin board covered in pictures of identified and eliminated hunters. Puffed up like a petty tyrant, thumbs through a stack of courier messages. Report. An easy mop-up. 
A single ragtag Van Helsing thinking a get em ray plan in the dead of night was a good idea. Inventory. Pretty standard kill kit. Pistols, stakes, gasoline, road flares. But we did find this. I hand over a small black book. It's got some cipher. Did you attempt to break it? Not my department. Excellent work, Mr. Reed. Report back here tomorrow for more decoy duty. Both of you. Usher glances up long enough to see Rebel's reaction when he smirks. This is bullshit. Rebel? How long are you going to keep sending us out there? Until the second Inquisition is eliminated. Or you die. Don't you worry. I plan to live long enough to gut you from your balls to your brains. Rebel. That's the spirit. Sheriff Usher, please do not work our favorite Bruja into a hissy fit. Marlowe Voigt. Now Toreador Primogen. My former partner in crime, my... my former friend. Whatever. I'll be outside. See you at the party tonight. I'm not going to that stupid thing. Hmm. You say that like you have a choice. What? All clans must be represented. Prince's orders. And as you are the only Bruja in Port Saga, your attendance is required. Of course it is. Great, just fucking great. I hate this city. <laughs> oh, come on. Who doesn't want to hear Titus tickle the ivories? Ah, so Quill told you he's making me play. <laughs> of course he did. Do you know what would be amazing? If you came to the party as my plus one. No. I mean, gosh. <laughs> Take a second to think about it. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. And the answer is still no. I am very, very politely asking you to come with me. Who knows? You might enjoy yourself? I'd rather chew razor blades. Aw, I thought we were friends. That was before you stabbed me in the back. Uh-uh-uh, I stabbed you in the front, Titus. Huh, <laughs> what's that? Oscar Wilde? See? You would have made an excellent Toreador. And you would have made an exemplary Bali, you bitch! Titus? Brave you turning that filthy mouth of yours on the prince's child. Let's go. I... apologize. Apology accepted. See you later, alligators. Under the light of the hunter's moon, black waters swirl around the prince's yacht. The Toreador have billed tonight as a victory party for our efforts against the Second Inquisition. It's the first gathering we've had since most of us went to ground. Though by the looks of it, not everyone is in a party mood. Or maybe they aren't sure if it's safe to come out. The crowd's a little thin. Quill hasn't arrived yet, but Marlowe's holding court. Constance is talking with Rebel, and Zelda, who has taken to wearing tailored fatigues and a black sequin beret, is in a quiet conversation with an unfamiliar face. Good to see ya, kid. And Edmund Glass is here as well. Primogen Glass. How goes the hunter hunting? Slowly. Titus, allow me to introduce you to Anna Sandoval, the new Tremere Primogen, just in from Richmond. Primogen Sandoval, this is Titus Reed, Malkavian Whip. The new Primogen squints at me as if she were more interested in examining my organs than shaking my hand. Probably doesn't help that she looks like she stepped out of the fashion pages of a cult weekly, draped in dark fabrics and wearing a cameo choker for a touch of Proliesque flair. So, you're taking over for Dante? I am. Are you why he hasn't been executed yet? I've asked the prince to indulge in a brief delay, but I assure you, his execution is inevitable. Why the delay? Tremere business. <laughs> of course. I detect a murky assumption forming in your mind. Contrary to popular belief, gentle whip, not all Tremere have the same agenda. Do you know what he did to my sire? To my friend? Uh, I do. Though I am curious to hear your version of the tale. Speak with me later, if you have a spare moment. Titus! 
Primogen Voigt. Primogen Glass. Primogen Sandoval. I do hope you're enjoying the party. Like Grandma at the bingo parlor. <sighs> ah, I really do envy people who have never met you. But please don't let me interrupt. I'm here to wrangle the entertainment. Titus, the piano's right over there. Right. A pleasure to meet you, Primogen Sandoval. Likewise. I obediently make my way to a baby grand piano near a window in a dimly lit area of the main deck. I sit down, curse my circumstances, and begin to play. I am but mad north northwest. When the wind is southerly, I know a hawk from a handsaw. Careful what you say in public. Constance joins me at the piano. As she leans against it, the velvet of her black and silver gown shimmers under the moonlight. I know. Good. She died in this room. Right over there, I can still hear the sizzle of Aaron's body turning to ash. All things die, Titus. Is that why you're playing Beethoven? Mozart. Hmm? This is Mozart. No, it isn't. <laughs> yes, it is. A Moonlight Sonata may have been inspired by the death scene in Mozart's Don Giovanni, but Beethoven wrote it. Are you sure? I briefly met the woman he dedicated it to before she died. I didn't realize you were so old, uh, mature. And I thought you went to school for this. I dropped out. Assembled kindred, the man of the hour. Alexander Quill, elder and prince, swaggers across the deck to take center stage, basking in the attention. Usher and Craven follow and stand on either side of him. Kindred of Port Saga, we come together tonight to celebrate our victories over the Second Inquisition. The war is not yet over. And I know we have lost more than a few friends to these villains. But we must persevere. We are close. So very close to achieving our aims. Soon we will be able to socialize as we once did, hunt our prey as it befits our station, and return to our Machiavellian agendas without distraction. All it requires is our continued dedication to the combined strength of our ivory tower. As we defend the Camarilla, so too does she defend us. This is why it was so important to have every clan in the city represented here tonight. We are proof of our founder's dream, vincam etiam ab inferis. Even from the grave, I shall conquer. Friends, the year was 1394 when Hardestat the Elder and the Tremere Councilor Mir Lenda brought a member of each of the original seven clans together in Vienna. Hardestat chose to represent the Ventru. Mir Lenda chose Mistress Fashon to represent the Tremere. For the Toreador, it was Raphael de Corazon. Adonidas Vorza represented the Bruja. The Malkavians had Camilla Baines. And the Gangrel, Milov Petrenkov. And last but not least, Joseph Van Baren spoke for the Nosferatu. This coterie formed in response to the First Inquisition and the terror of the burning times. They would go on to become our first and most illustrious Justicars. It was they who laid the bricks of our ivory tower. And for over seven centuries, we have survived by acting as sentries on the walls they built. In this spirit of mutual defense, I make the following proclamations. First, I welcome two new residents to Port Saga. The first is Anna Sandoval, the new primogen of Clan Tremere. The Tremere primogen stiffens and forces a thin smile as the room's attention turns to her. And as a testament to my extraordinary campaign against the minions of the Second Inquisition, 
I give you Coleman Locke, Archon to the current Nosferatu Justicar, Her Grace Molly MacDonald. Archon Locke joins us to learn more about the strategy and tactics we are using against the enemy. Ah, Locke was the unfamiliar face I saw speaking with Zelda. There's no way he's Nosferatu. There isn't a trace of their hideous curse on him. He has an athletic build with blue eyes and sandy blonde hair. Conventionally handsome, if not for the boyish features he's hiding under a stubble beard. An archon in Port Saga. Regardless of how Quill spins it, this doesn't bode well. Now we must come to the unfortunate matter of Dante Mendoza. I know this criminal's fate is of concern to some of you. Instinctively, I lean forward. With Sandoval's insistence that his execution was inevitable, perhaps Lady Justice will finally balance the scales. He is indeed guilty of violating the first tradition in the murder of Lawrence Bennett. But... My stomach drops into my shoes. I think I'm going to be sick. After careful consideration, I hereby commute his death sentence. Instead, Dante Mendoza will remain at Cardiff House in perpetuity, putting his extensive knowledge and skill to use on behalf of the city. I move to stand, to shout and scream at the injustice of the moment when Constance puts a hand on my shoulder and shoves me back onto the piano bench. I scan the room, measuring the reactions of Marlowe, Zelda, and Usher. None of them seem surprised. Sandoval frowns, and Rebel looks like she's about to scream. Furthermore, the policy of my predecessor granting amnesty to those thin bloods who swear allegiance to the Camarilla is hereby revoked. Any thin blood found in Port Saga will be taken into custody and delivered to Cardiff House so Mr. Mendoza may continue his research. For every thin blood delivered to me, I will grant a major boon. Archon Locke's eyes widen with surprise, but otherwise he says nothing. What about those Duskborn, like myself, who have already taken the brand? An excellent question. All current Thinbloods who have already taken the brand will also be taken into custody and delivered to Cardiff House. Sheriff Usher sees them immediately. The room erupts as Usher and those currying favor with Quill grab the few Thinbloods in the room and drag them to the lower decks. The rest of us do nothing and allow the horror to unfold. All except Rebel. Are you fucking serious? Miss Everhart. They took the brand. They swore an oath. They, they spilled blood for the city, and this is how you repay them? What kind of prince hands his subjects to a convicted criminal to be experimented on? Your sentiment towards the Thin Bloods is quite touching, Miss Everhart, though I wonder if it doesn't divulge a secret loyalty that runs counter to the Camarilla. What? The Bruja. A clan present at the founding of our sect. A clan who stood with us for centuries until just a few scant years ago. When Theo Bell killed Hardestat, instead of accepting responsibility and facing the consequences, to which sect did the clan of betrayers run? The Anarch Movement. That is correct. The Bruja abandoned the Camarilla to become Anarchs. Anarchs who welcome the Thin Bloods with open arms. And here you are, a Bruja, defending the lot and questioning my authority as Prince. Are you an Anarch, Miss Everhart? I am loyal to the Camarilla. Prove it. I'm here, aren't I? Even with your sheriff treating me like expendable cannon fodder? Words of loyalty coming from Bruja are flimsy at best. No. Only action will suffice. The prince shrugs out of his corduroy blazer and passes it to Craven to hold. Then he unfastens the gold cufflink of his French cut shirt and rolls the sleeve up to his elbow. Finally, using the long, sharp fingernail of his opposite thumb, he cuts into the soft underside of his forearm. 
The room stills in expectation of what they know will come next. Blood pools in the cut. And when he stretches out his hand to rebel, the thick, syrupy vitae runs down his arm and drips from his fingertips. Among the onlookers, nostrils flare and chests heave as the coppery scent hits their senses. The dire application of will is the only thing holding the bloodsuckers back. Marlowe's knuckles go white as she grips onto the arms of her chair, and Usher looks like he'd get on his knees to lick it off the floor. I ask you again, Miss Everhart. Are you an Anarch? I try to stand again when Constance shoves me back down. Not now, Titus. I have to help her. He is looking for a reason to kill you both. Don't give it to him. He's going to bloodbond her. I know. Kneel and drink. I have been a devoted servant to the Camarilla and this domain. When the rest of my clan left, I stayed. I have risked my life countless times for the rest of you. And this is how you repay me. By standing there. Saying nothing. Doing nothing. Drink, or I'll have Usher take your head off like he did Miss McKenna's. Rebel looks at me like a wild animal caught in a trap, ready to chew off her arm if it meant she'd escape. But we wear the same yoke. I have no power here. I mouth the words, I'm sorry, and her shoulders crumple. She drags herself to Quill like a beaten dog and kneels before him to drink his blood. Good girl. When she's finished, Rebel comes stumbling back to Constance and me, wiping the blood from her lips with shaking hands. I need to get the fuck out of here. Let's go. Titus! I'm done playing, Marlo. Alexander would like to have a private word with you. Now? Seriously? Yes. Now. It's all right, Titus. I'll take Rebel. Meet up with us afterward. I'm led to the yacht's lower deck crew mess. A cold black body bag rests on the table, sweating with condensation. Mr. Reed, I regret missing the opportunity to hear you play. I hear you perform rather well. Very precise, I'm told. I doubt I could compete with the performance you just delivered. You're lucky to have a friend like Marlowe. I don't know what she sees in you exactly. You're a six at best. Why am I here, Your Majesty? I wanted to see the man who helped kill all those Anarchs under Reynolds. The man who killed Father Frank and helped rid the city of those pesky hunters at the church. The man who investigated the death of his sire and friend and brought a criminal to justice. Justice? Of course. What about Usher? What about Dante? Dante remains a prisoner at Cardiff House. No, no, death is too easy, Mr. Reed. My plan is so much better. You'll see this in time. Your Majesty, please. Why am I here? I told you. Because you're good at getting things done. And I need something done. What do you need? Mr. Reed, I have a loose thread with a mind of her own. Who? Adelaide Hale. She's out there. Somewhere. Plotting her revenge against me. Find her. Bring her to me. Do that, and I will give you Usher on a silver platter. There's always free cheese in a mousetrap. With all due respect, Your Majesty, you don't want me doing this. She had your friend executed, Mr. Reed, for a crime she didn't commit. You owe Hale nothing. It's not that. Then enlighten me, boy. Because frankly, I owe the Venture a substantial number of boons. To get to her, I must go through them. But if they call in those debts, I'd be bound to obey, which could cause unnecessary complications to your request. My request? Is that what I made? Your Majesty- Perhaps you simply need the right incentive. 
Unzip that body bag, would you? Inside is a frozen corpse with a priest with no face. The one from the night we assaulted St. Michael's Church. The one I told everyone was Frank. That black book you found tonight? The one with the cipher? It provided us with the last piece of a confounding puzzle. And yet, the solution has proven more troubling than the initial problem. Could you remind me who this man is again? Uh... Father Francis, the Society of Leopold Hunter. You wouldn't lie to me, would you, son? Because I would hate to discover the de facto leader of the Second Inquisition was still alive this whole time. Killing your friends. Massacring those who put their safety in my hands. Uh, maybe I was just confused? Uh, now I'm not so sure. Just confused. Not sure. Hmm. I see. If you want to lie about killing this hunter to inflate your reputation, that's fine. But had we known he was still alive, we would have planned our campaign very differently. We would have deployed our resources to hunt down this Grand Inquisitor instead of spending weeks blind to the reality that we were not beset by various opportunists, but were fighting against a coordinated campaign. I wonder how the rest of the city will react if they find out about this. Especially those who have lost their sire, or child, or friend, to this phantom priest you claim to have put down. The trap springs. Your Majesty, I take full responsibility for not confirming this man's identity. Bring me Adelaide Hale, Mr. Reed, or I will throw you to the beasts of Port Saga. (laughs) <laughs> God. I am so fucked. Vampire the Masquerade, Port Saga, created by Rachel J. Wilkinson, with voice performances by Dane Geist, Kat Mermelstein, Marta De Silva, Michelle Wynn Bradley, Luke Hales, Stephanie Tobin, Greg Berry, Matthew Webb, Jack Lancaster, Ray Stacanus, and Logan Michael Bose. Sound design by Rachel J. Wilkinson. Mixing and mastering by Brandon Strader. Portions of this podcast are the copyrights and trademarks of Paradox Interactive AB and are used with permission, all rights reserved. For more information, please visit worldofdarkness.com. 